Welcome to Soldier Field, home of the Chicago Bears. I'm Wayne Larravee, Bears play-by-play -play announcer on WGN Radio 720, along with Bears Hall of Famer Dick Butkus, now a color commentator on WGN. You know, Dick, broadcasting from our perch here high atop Soldier Field, we've seen some of the greatest moments in Bears history. That's for sure, Wayne, and I was fortunate enough to be part of that history on the field. The Bears tradition is a great one, spanning 75 years, and in this, the 75th anniversary of the Bears and the NFL, we can relive some of that history. History, thanks to Jewel Food Stores and Coca-Cola. So kick back, relax, and enjoy as Jewel Food Stores, Coca-Cola, and WGN Radio proudly presents the greatest moments in Chicago Bears history. Here's a wonderful day for a football game in Chicago. 75 years of Chicago Bears football. It's the legendary Papa Bear. It's the Blues Brothers and fathers and sons together at Soldier Field. It's the monsters of the Midway, then and today. It's the power and grace of a star named Sweetness. It's the flash and wonder of the Kansas Comet. It's Mike Singletary's eyes and tearful, heroic goodbyes. It's Iron Mike, Willie the Wisp, the Bear Fight Song. It's Brian's song. It's the class of the great Sid Luckman and the sass of the undaunted Jim McMahon. They thrilled us with their T-formation. They chilled us with the 46 defense. They were true warriors. They pointed the way, and we followed. This is the story of magic moments, milestones, and memories. 75 years of Chicago Bears football. The Roaring Twenties, speakeasies thrived. The babe was hitting homers, and America was growing. Such was the backdrop for the founding of the NFL. At the forefront was an entrepreneur, and pretty good end, named George Stanley Hallis. He ran the Decatur Staley's, later the Decatur Bears, and ultimately he convinced the great Red Grange to play for his Chicago Bears. The galloping ghost packed him in. Hallis signed a bruising runner named Bronco Nagurski and Hall of Fame end Bill Hewitt, and in 1933, the Bears faced the Giants in the first world championship ever. Fueled by the running of Nagurski and a game-winning lateral from Bronco to Hewitt to Bill Carr, the Bears won 23 to 21. On Thanksgiving in 34, the Lions and Bears met in the first national radio broadcast. Fans munched drumsticks and listened to their beloved Bears. Hallis built a dynasty that dominated the 40s. Bulldog Turner, George McAfee, and quarterback Sid Luckman were each paid 873 bucks for crushing the Redskins 73 to nothing in the 1940 championship game. The T formation worked again the next year as the Bears beat the Packers 33 to 14 in the first divisional playoff in NFL history. A week later, George McAfee's touchdown and a fumble return for a score by Ken Cavanaugh sparked Chicago to its fifth NFL championship, a 37-9 win over the Giants. The Bears were champions yet again in 1946 as Sid Luckman picked off passes and scored the game winner on a bootleg play called Bingo Keep It. 
The guiding light was Hallis. He won his first title at 26 and his last at 68. For over half a century, he was the Bears, and his like will never be seen again. Back in 1925, Red Grange began what was to become a lasting legacy of great Chicago running backs. Five years later, the galloping ghost was followed by a wrecking ball named Bronco Nagurski. While Nagurski ran over the opposition, Willie Gallimore sidestepped them. For seven seasons, he was a cat-quick escape artist who came to be known as Willie the Wisp. Willie Gallimore puts the Bears on their way to another score. Willie Gallimore reverses his field. Bobbles the ball, gets it back, shakes off tackler after tackler on a spectacular touchdown gallop. Gallimore's backfield mate was Rick Caceres, one of the meanest men to ever wear the burnt orange and navy blue. Caceres was an ex-boxer who ran mad all the time. In fact, Mike Ditka called him the single toughest player he'd ever known. In 1975, a rock-hard runner from Jackson State suited up, and the rest was history. His name was Walter Payton. Thirteen seasons, and nearly 17,000 yards later, he became the NFL's all-time leading rusher. Some are in awe of his mountain of statistics. Others recall the tacklers he overran and dragged. For others, it was his patented end zone leaps. When asked what his fondest memory was, Sweetness said it was this 1975 journey against the Saints, the centerpiece, a run he called the finest of his career. You didn't have to be a back to be a great runner in Chicago. Take Bobby Douglas, for instance. In 1972, he set the NFL record for rushing yards in a season by a quarterback when he reeled off 968, a mark that still stands to this day. The longest run ever at Soldier Field was this 80-yard score by Neil Anderson against the Packers in 1988. Thomas Anderson looks to cut it back, now bounces to a quick In 1965, rookie Gail Sayers turned in the greatest single game performance ever. On December 12th, on a brisk winter's day, Wrigley Field was covered with heavy crusted mud. For Sayers, it was like one of those one-sided late afternoon pickup games on a soggy Kansas cornfield with his pals. Fans had barely settled into their seats when they realized that Sayers had three, then four touchdowns, and he was just getting warmed up. Like those overmatched kids back in Kansas, the 49ers spent the day eating the mud that flew off the heels of the Comet. After his fifth touchdown, the crowd cheered for one more. And what George Hallis would later say is the greatest performance he'd ever seen Sayers was put back in to return a kick, and the result was an NFL record sixth touchdown. In the mud, a rookie became a legend. It was a magic moment for the ages by a superhero, a comet that would sadly burn out after only seven seasons. Twelve glorious seasons, a Hall of Fame career that helped change the face of professional football and shape the life 
of Sid Lockman. Whatever my success has been, there hasn't been anything in the business world or anything I've ever done that could possibly equal the thrills that I have enjoyed in football. The thrills began in 1939 when Bears head coach George Hallis drafted Luckman out of Columbia University to run one of football's most revolutionary offenses. As a quarterback in Hallis' innovative T formation, number 42 threw for more than 14,000 yards and 137 touchdowns, both Bears records that still stand. In just his second season, Luckman led Chicago into the 1940 NFL championship game against the Redskins, a team which had beaten the Bears 7-3 just three weeks earlier. George Preston Marshall, the owner of the Redskins, came out with these glaring headlines that the Bears were front runners, the Bears were crybabies, and Washington was going to destroy them. There was no way the Bears could possibly play against them. They'd beaten us once, and they could beat us again. George Howard, being a great psychologist, and he was, he took that newspaper and hung it up right in the dressing room, and he said, here it is. This is what the Redskins and the owners think about you. Is my opinion of you is that you're the greatest football team in America. My opinion of you, you got to prove it to yourself, which is very, very important. Prove it to your family and prove it to the fans of America. We went out on that field, and it was almost devastating. On the game's second play from scrimmage, the Bears' George Wilson delivered the game's most devastating block. After Bill Osmanski's 68-yard touchdown run, Sid Luckman and the Bears continued to bomb the shell-shocked Redskins. The Bears rolled to an astounding 73 to nothing victory, the most lopsided win in championship game history. It was the first of four world championships the Bears would win over the next seven seasons. During that time, Sid Luckman continued to set new standards at quarterback, with one of his most historic performances coming against the Giants in 1943. In front of his hometown New York crowd, Luckman became the first quarterback to throw for more than 400 yards in a game and also established an NFL record with seven touchdown passes. It's one of the few games that my mother ever went to. She was always afraid uh, I would play and get hurt. So I was running with the ball, and she's sitting next to my brother and sister. He, he said, please, Sid, please, Sid, give him the ball. Let them run with it. I don't want you to run with the ball. My mom was that way, and she refused to just go to many games, but uh, she did go to that one. That made, the, that made it that much nicer, that much more thrilling for me that she was there. Later that season, Luckman led the Bears to the third NFL title, throwing for five touchdowns and intercepting two passes against the Redskins. I think probably that was, humbly I say, that's the best game I've probably ever played. Indeed, it was one of the best all-around performances by any player ever. The Bears' championship reign was a tribute not only to the on-field leadership of Luckman, but also to the legendary guidance of coach George Hallis, a man whose innovative vision and inner fire drove his team to greatness. If you ask me the kind of man he was, uh, tough, fair, tremendous coach, great psychologist, a human being that all of us on the team admired and respected. The ingenious X's and O's drawn up in his playbook helped change the game. But perhaps Hallis made his greatest impression on Luckman in one short letter written in 1983. I was 88 years old, and he wrote me this letter before he passed away. My dear Sid, I love you with all my heart. When I said this to you last night as I kissed you, I realized 44 wonderful years of knowing you was summed up by seven words. My boy, my pride in you has no bounds. You are the consummate player. Remember, Remember our, our word now. now. Every time I said it to you, you brought me another championship. You added a luster to my life that can never tarnish. My devoted friend, you have a spot in my heart no one else can ever claim. God bless you and keep you, my son. I love you with all of my heart, Coach George Hallis. Thank you all tonight. I'm blessed. 
So I stand here to tell you the camaraderie, the friendship, the cheers, the crowd, the smell of the grass. They'll take away all the things in my life, but they'll never take away the memories as I reach out that seem like yesterday. God bless you and thank you very, very much. Feathers was a lean Tennessee rookie, often overshadowed by teammate Bronco Nagurski. But in 1934, he grabbed the spotlight by rushing for 1,004 yards, the first man ever in NFL history to crack the 1,000-yard mark. Fighting Irish quarterback Johnny Lujak got the hot hand 15 years later when he set an NFL record by passing for 468 yards against the Cardinals. Lujak fired six touchdown passes one short of Sid Luckman's mark set in 1943. Perhaps the greatest bear receiver ever was Harlan Hill from tiny Florence State Teachers College. He was a lightning quick game breaker. And in 1956 against the Giants, he made the greatest catch in Bears history. When the Bears get the ball again, 65 seconds remain to be played as Ed Brown passes. Harlan Hill makes the catch of the year to complete an unbelievable comeback in professional football's most spectacular game. In and inside the 10, Dennis makes a play on it at the 6, cutting left to the 10. Good move. Dennis McKinnon's acrobatic return against the defending champion Giants was a memorable moment indeed. And in 1990, Johnny Bailey returned to punt 95 yards, the longest in Bear history. Dick Butkus will never be remembered for his returning prowess, but imagine for a moment that you're the wedge buster, and you look up only to find number 51 barreling straight upfield directly at you. Perhaps Butka should have allowed teammate Cecil Turner to handle the return chores. After all, Turner tied an NFL record by returning four kickoffs for touchdowns in 1970. The greatest ever, of course, was Gail Sayers, the feared kick returner for the NFL's 75th anniversary all-time team. There have been many happy returns over the years. But none more amazing than Dave Williams' Thanksgiving gallop on the overtime kickoff in Detroit in 1980. We're underway here in overtime. Davey Williams at the 5, to the 10, to the 15, to the 20. He breaks through to the 25, to the 30. Coming to the near sideline. He's to the 40. He's to the 50. On the sideline. He's to the 30. He may score. He's going to win it. A kickoff return by Davey Williams. 95 yards. And the Bears win it in unbelievable fashion. The 1963 Chicago Bears were, like their coach George Hallis, fiery, feisty, and frequently ill-tempered. A championship year, two years before I got there in 63, they just always came up with characters that were uh, tough son of a gun, you know, and they, and they played like it was supposed to be played. We were completely loose. I mean, we were loose the whole year. I mean, we just, we laugh at everything. And how we won, I don't know. 
we got every break going. We had felt opposition about 10 points. Atkins led the Monsters of the Midway, football's meanest and stingiest defense, a unit comprised of men who worked hard, yet played hard, too. Doug Atkins and I got a martini drinking contest one night, and I think it was 21 when I left it. And uh, he had to drive me home. Now, how we ever made it, I don't know. But it was my wife was in an apartment in Chicago, and I got into the apartment, and I fell into the bathtub, and I couldn't get out. So she said she would call Doug. So she called Doug. He was living in the same apartment hotel. Doug comes down, and she hands him the baby and said, you hold the baby, Doug. And then she looked at him and said, well, hell, you're as drunk as he is. But on Sundays, the Bears were sober, sullen, and deadly serious. When you came to play the Bears in Wrigley Field, it's very simple. When you had to go up against guys like Doug Atkins, Stan Jones, Ed Obradovich, Bill George, Richie Pettibone, Larry Morris, you had some of those gorillas looking at you. Come hell or high water, the Bears were going to put a physical beating on you. I don't care whether you won or lost. You're going to know you in the damnedest game you ever been in your whole life. Unlike most championship teams, the Chicago players who got most of the attention were on the defensive unit. We proved defense can win it. We can win a championship on defense. Not that our offense didn't produce, you know, from the 20 to 20, they were fantastic. Slight problem trying to get into the end zone. There were stars on offense with names like Morris, Ditka, and Gallimore. But the defense seldom missed any chance to needle the men with a football. The rivalry was mostly from the defensive team. We, the offensive team never paid much attention to all that. It was just something the defensive team seemed to need something to gear themselves up, like you're talking about practices and so forth. Well, man, we were out there just to do a job. We gave people a lot of fits offensively. Even though we averaged uh, the 14 points a game, our turnover ratio was the smallest in the league. So offensively speaking, we felt, you know, we did our part. We felt they did their part. They were more colorful, you might say. The Chicago defense was both colorful and lethal in the NFL championship game. Playing in the nine above zero icebox of Wrigley Field, the Bears beat the New York Giants 14 to 10 for Chicago's first championship since 1946. Play with these guys that, god damn it, they were men. Uh, the word was their bond. Uh, they went out on a football field and they knocked the hell out of people. And I'm so thankful that I had the opportunity to play with, uh, with the people I did in 63. Great people. Gale Sayers, number 40, exploded into the NFL in 1965. By the end of that season, he had scored 22 touchdowns, more than any player in the history of the NFL. For five years, Sayers' legs continued to pump. He led the league in rushing twice, set an NFL record for kickoff returns, and once scored an incredible six touchdowns in a single game. He's the only guy, I think, that could be running, stop on a dime, tell you whether it's head to tail, and not even break stride. What we remember about Gale Sayers are not certain games or plays. We remember the moves. Each one an original. Never seen before, never seen again.
I've watched him put moves on guys coming up behind him. I mean, four yards away. No back has ever been able to do that. I had great peripheral vision. There's no doubt about that. I could see everybody on the field. And so I knew where to, where to run, where to cut. In the same way, I, could, I had a, a, a feel for where people were. Because I know many times, many runs, and I want to look at films. There'd be a fellow coming from my blind side, and uh, no way I could see him, but I could feel him. And he gave me a fake like this here, and my body went one way, my mind went the other way, and you, something happens to your motor when that happens. It's hard to explain, but my legs went limp, and I had nothing left. But the only problem he made was he went one too many fakes and came right back into me, and I hit him and knocked him down. He said, nice tackle, Floyd. And I want to say, I couldn't even tackle him if I wanted to. You ran into me. <laughs> Gail planted to foot and went through these people, and I thought I, I saw him uh, an amoeba-like, or paramecium, split into two things, and the defensive people went at the wrong one. Sayer's style, while beautiful, was deadly. In 1968, the dangers he so deftly sidestepped caught up to him. They say that uh, when, once you get a knee injury, you should think about quitting because uh, a running back very rarely comes back from the type of knee injury that I had. But uh, quitting, I want to prove that one could come back from a serious knee injury within a year. They say so many times, well, it takes two years, take three years to come back. I want to prove that you could come back. And uh, as I said, I had one of the worst knee injuries ever. The next year, I think Gale Sayers came up with maybe the best performance of his entire life. He got his thousand yards rushing, and the longest run he made from scrimmage that whole year was 28 yards. But he was determined to get that thousand yards, to do that job, and instead of being able to run around everybody, he just had to do it the hard way inside in and he did it. While Sayers' courage carried him to the rushing title in 1969, it was his instinctive skill that lifted him to a pedestal from which he will never fall. I proudly present for induction into the Hall of Fame Gale Sayers, his like will never be seen again. Gale Sayers' NFL career consisted of only 68 games. But in the eternal autumn of football memories, he remains undiminished, forever vibrant and free. A comet cited by all who study the firmament of football. Dick was, was an animal. I call him a maniac, a stone maniac. He's the kind of linebacker that when he hit our backs, our back would go back in the huddle, he'd be talking out his ear hole. He'd want to know who was supposed to block that crazy sucker. Before you could begin to try to block on Dick, you had to overcome the mystique. And uh, he didn't appreciate this, but I said it was almost like an odor. He exuded a kind of a presence. He tried to hurt you. You know, he was just so competitive you know, not only did he not want you to gain a yard, he didn't want you to gain an inch. You know, as soon as you had that football, you were the enemy.
Dick Butkus played football with a religious fervor, with an unrelenting obsession not only to excel, but to dominate and demoralize. Dick was not satisfied with just an ordinary tackle. He had to hit you, pick you up, drive you, and grind you into the ground. For Dick Butkus, football was never a game, but a street fight. A place for all-out, no-holds-barred warfare. And he was a well-conditioned animal, and every time he hit you, he tried to put you in the cemetery, not the hospital. Butkus was the most destructive defender in the game. And the NFL is filled with horror stories of tough men who crossed him. He knocked out L.C. Greenwood on a, on a punt. I remember, and he knocked out Warren Banks, and he was a full back, back at fullback we had, but a good special teams player. And I remember Warren stood on the sideline crazes. I don't know who I am. Because Buck is a blind side and just K on him. For Dick to run a 100-yard dash, it'd take him three days. But I want to tell you something from that middle linebacker. 20 yards this way, 20 yards that way, 20 yards that way. I mean, nobody, nobody was quicker than he was. He made a lot of interceptions. If he was told in past defenses to be in a certain area, I mean, he was there. He had great hands. The man was uh, unbelievable. His whole damn life was football. Forget about it. Wasn't driving a pretty car. It wasn't going to the local bar and pounding your chest, I'm the greatest. It was the opposite. Uh, you know, I'm really not the tough, macho guy. That was only during the game. And uh, no matter how hard you try to explain that, it, sure you were, you know. <laughs> so He's basically a pain in the ass. You know, again, I know him. and. Uh, He's got a personality like a fried lobster. It was horrifying playing against him because he can intimidate literally an entire offensive team, and I mean good teams. We had a rookie center uh, that was playing against him for the first time. And, of course, you remember Buck has grunted a lot and growled a lot when he was backing up the line. And we sent this rookie center in to, to play for us. And the first time he came off, his eyes were about like this. He, he couldn't believe what he was hearing from Buckus. Buckus had him intimidated. He hadn't even blocked him yet. Buckus dominated a game the way no other player ever has. He dominated officials. He'd take the ball away from the guy after the play and shake it in the official's face, and the official would point it their way. It was awesome. I was working, and Buckus came up to me, and he started to wave his finger at me. I sort of smiled at him and said, Buckus, I said, don't wave your finger at me. I said, I'll bite your head off. He looked at me and said, well, if you bite my head off, you'll have more brains in your stomach than you will have in your head. From his personality to the impact of his tackles, everything Dick Butkus did was memorable. Although he played on only two winning teams, he did not lower his standards to fit the company. He was Moby Dick in a goldfish bowl. His nine-year career stands apart as the single most sustained work of devastation ever committed on a football field by anyone, anywhere, anytime. To talk about him is to drain the vocabulary of superlatives. Well, the only thing I can say about the great Dick Butkus, I'll say it in a, in a, in a poem. Roses are red and violets are blue. 
If you've got any sense, you'll keep Butkus away from you. All right, here we go. The Eagles have never beaten the Bears in Chicago. And they wouldn't this time either, as Tom Zack and McKinnon got the Bears off to a lightning start. Jeffrey comes in motion to the near side, now turns back the other way, snap to Tom Zack, rushes on. Tom Zack has time, he rainbows the right side, McKinnon wide open, ahead of the field, yeah. to the 30, to the 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, yeah. touchdown Bears! 64 yards! <laughs> Give us Anderson, first up, the touchdown! Illinois poet Carl Sandburg wrote, The fog creeps in on little cat feet. In moments, Soldier Field was shrouded in an eerie thick mist. Under pressure and a smothering blanket of fog in a game where announcers couldn't announce, coordinators couldn't coordinate, and fans couldn't see, the Bear defense made the plays that had to be made. You can get ground all you want, but you got to hold them to a field goal. You don't want to let them in the end zone. There's the snap now to Cunningham on first and ten with no huddle. He fired the left side, and it's intercepted, I believe. Intercepted by the Bears and returned downfield. I can't see. I cannot see him. I wonder if it's Bo Douglas. It is Bo Douglas. Who football. comes across the field through the fog with the football in his left arm. You know, actually, if Mike Ditka had come across the field with the ball, we could have assumed he intercepted it. <laughs> Chicago was one victory away from Super Bowl 23. After 50 years of football, the Bears played their last game at Wrigley Field. The date was December 13, 1970. The opponent was perennial rival Green Bay, and the man of the hour was quarterback Jack Concannon. Concannon kept the Packers off balance by running and found 1,000-yard receiver Dick Gordon for a score. Chicago never looked back. Dooley's Bears rolled 35 to 17 and bid farewell to Wrigley and Style. In 1971, Soldier Field became their new home, and the eventual four-time Super Bowl champion Steelers, led by Terry Bradshaw, were in town to help christen the Bears' new den. At first, it appeared that Chicago never should have cut the ribbon, but a big play by linebacker Ross Brubacher launched a comeback. The game winner was a touchdown pass from Kent Nix to George Farmer, as life at Soldier Field was off to a dramatic start in a new home that would be the site of even greater victories. If you prevailed upon Walter Payton to describe what happened on that memorable November Sunday back in 1977, he'd probably just say that his offensive line blocked exceptionally well. He might recall that he carried the ball 40 times, a workhorse on a gray, overcast day. If you questioned Hall of Famer Alan Page and the rest of the Viking defenders about what Walter did that day, you just get a shrug or a shake of the head. But if you ask the fans and Walter's teammates what he did, they'd tell you this. On November 20th, 1977, Walter Payton set the NFL record by rushing for an incredible 275 yards in one game. How did Walter feel about setting the record? Well, he'd probably just repeat, my line was sure blocking right that day. For 14 years, 
the Bears had been frozen out of the playoffs. But against the Giants in the 1977 season finale, they reached deep. Horrendous conditions foiled Walter Payton's run at a 2,000-yard season. But Mother Nature saved her cruelest tricks for Chicago special teams. The Giants and Bears were tied at nine at the end of regulation. A tie would eliminate Chicago from the playoffs. So like a pack of resolute sled dogs, the Bears moved out into the blizzard in overtime. With just over three minutes left in sudden death, the field goal team missed connections again, but the misfortune only deepened their resolve. And when the Bears got the ball back, only 82 seconds separated them from success or failure. With nine seconds left in sudden death, Chicago's fate rested once more on the leg of Bob Thomas. There's a snap, it's a good one. Thomas puts it in the air. It's good! It's good! The Bears are in the playoffs! The Bears are in the playoffs! The Bears are in the playoffs! Bob Thomas hits a 28 yard field goal, and there's jubilation. The Bears have overcome everything and look down here. They're rolling on the ground here. We got Parsons and Neal wrestling on the ground in the ice here in jubilation. And the Bears, at the last second, have defeated the New York Giants in overtime, and they have captured a 12 to 9 decision here. And what a happy guy Bob Thomas must be right now. December 7th, 1980. A date that will live in infamy for Packer fans. A date that will shine forever for Bears fans. Walter Payton and Roland Harper helped launch the attack and what followed was a head-spinning avalanche of points. For three decades, 30 first downs was the club record. They ripped off 33 against the overmatched Packers. Quarterback Vince Evans completed over 80% of his passes, and the Bears scored an astounding nine touchdowns. When it was over, the final score read, Bears 61, Packers 7. The most points ever scored by one team at Soldier Field. In 1984, Peyton stood at the gates of pro football immortality. On a cool October day at Chicago's Soldier Field, this determined athlete entered a new world, one all his own. Right, here we go, McMahon asked for quiet. Second play of the second half of the 21-yard line. Walter needs two to break the record. High formation, quick pitch to Walter, looking for the record, cuts back, he's got it, he's out of it at 25 to the 26-yard line. Walter Payton becomes the National Football League all-time leading rusher, surpassing Jim Brown. And that's the equivalent to Hank Aaron breaking Babe Ruth's all-time home run record. And listen to the standing ovation. The motivating drive for me has been for the athletes that have tried, but yet and still have failed to reach that certain achievement. And also the athletes that, uh, that didn't get an opportunity to, like the Overstreets and the Delaney's and the Brian Piccolo's. You know, this simplifies what the game is made of. And what I did out there today is a reflection of those guys because they made the sacrifices as well. And it's a tribute to me to bestow this honor upon them. Thank you. With starter Jim McMahon sidelined with an injury, the Vikings took a 17-9 lead, forcing head coach Mike Ditka to summon the tricks of his magician-like quarterback. Evidence from the sidelines looks like Jim McMahon will be coming into quarterback. Spent two nights at Lake Forest Hospital for back spasms up near his neck. And he's on to try to revive the Bears' offense. Peyton Malone setback. Suey in motion to the left 
side. Vikings coming on a blitz. McMahon back to throw. Throws the deep down the middle. Willie Gold is out there. Makes the over the shoulder. Catch to the 30. To the 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. Touchdown. All right. <laughs> the first play from scrimmage for Jim McMahon with an all-out blitz coming at him. He got it away. Of course, uh, McMahon took a nice shot after the play, but so what? McMahon's first two passes were for touchdowns, and he added a third to beat Minnesota 33-24. to With a 3-0 record, Chicago had begun its methodical march toward New Orleans, thanks in part to a quarterback who prefers the war down in the trenches with the foot soldiers. For the first time since 1963, Chicago was an arena for pro football's postseason gladiators. And while chilling memories of the Bears' proud past added to the already freezing temperatures, the only ice on the field was running through the veins of each Chicago player. end zone. Bears look at good field position. Oh, he oh, missed, missed it. Misses the football. He missed it. It's on the field. Oh, it's oh, it's Sean Gale. Holy smokes. One score was all the cushion the Bears needed. The Bears scored a convincing 21 to nothing shutout over the Giants, but their journey was still far from over. This is not the end of the road. I mean, there's work to be done. There's miles to go. That's the way the poem goes. We've got a little way to go yet. And I tell you, it's going to get better. Well, like I said, uh, the best is yet to come. It really is. Soldier Field in Chicago, the NFC Championship, and a trip to New Orleans for Super Bowl 20. After 23 years of waiting, Chicago's dream of a championship was soon to become a reality. We got it now! The lucky ticket! Son, this is the greatest day. Ooh, showtime, man. Showtime. This is what it's all about. This is for the world's championship right here now. As they had done all season long, all pro Jimbo Covert, Mark Bortz, Keith Van Horn, Tom Thayer, and pro bowler Jay Hilgenberg worked as an offensive line to launch the winning bear attack. The Mad Dog Bear defense shut down the Rams' Eric Dickerson, then ended the game in storybook fashion. But I mean, how better can you write a script here for crying out loud? Third down, 11 yards to go for Dieter Brock and company. Brock back to pass the rush on. Oh, and hammered down. Oh, oh, Picked up by Wilbur Marshall. Marshall running across the line. Go, go, go. 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 all the way. Five touchdowns. a goal. The crowning jewel in their NFC championship. A 
record second consecutive playoff shutout was a spectacular amen to the prayers of not only a football team, but of an entire city. In dramatic style, the Chicago Bears had captured a championship, thus restoring their link with the team's legendary past under George Hallis. And the reward was a trophy bearing his name. On January 26th, millions across the globe hung over their TV sets, and thousands of hungover Bourbon Streeters readied themselves for Super Bowl XX. The surprising New England Patriots and the mighty Chicago Bears squared off to determine who indeed was the NFL's best. The tone right now. You belong here. You're the best. Let's do it. New England's opportunism got them to this important game, but they failed to take advantage of rare Chicago mistakes in the first quarter. Still, they led three to nothing, but not for long. Jim McMahon's accurate arm and gutsy running helped the Bears to a six to three lead. And then number 26, Matt Suey, went to work. Bears led 13 to 3 after the first period, and they're punishing 46 defense, a unit that had shut out both the Giants and Rams in the playoffs, began to dominate. Number 58, Wilbur Marshall, helped sack Patriot quarterback seven times, while MVP Richard Dent and All-Pro Mike Singletary, number 50, limited New England to a Super Bowl record seven yards rushing. Chicago's is a high-tech, sophisticated defensive scheme. And for the Patriots this day, the 46 simply blew them away. <laughs> Historians may debate whether Chicago's defense was the best unit ever to play the game. But when Jim McMahon snuck in behind a crushing block by William Perry, number 72, no one could disagree that with a 23-3 halftime lead, the Bears had wrapped up Super Bowl XX by intermission. Mike Ditka's NFC champions were as bold on offense as they were on defense in this title game. As McMahon rifled a deep pass from his own end zone, instead of playing it safe early in the second half. Willie Galt's reception set up a second to Jim McMahon's short touchdown run. And the swarming monsters of the midway took it upon themselves to score one of their own. As number 48, Reggie Phillips, took a deflected pass in from 28 yards out. The Bears totaled three touchdowns in the third quarter. A Super Bowl record, with the last coming courtesy of the man everyone came to see, his immenseness, the refrigerator. William Perry's one-yard rumble gave Chicago an almost embarrassing 44-3 advantage. But for New England, there was one glimpse of glory left for them. An eight-yard score from veteran Steve Grogan to speedy Irving Fryer. It was only appropriate, however, that the Bear defense logged the final points in Super Bowl XX. And a safety, courtesy of Henry Waxter, provided the 46 to 10 final margin in a complete and total effort by the world champion Chicago Bears. When 1985 began, the Bears were on a mission. And in January of 1986, that mission was accomplished. George Hallis smiled down from heaven ear to ear. His beloved family had won their first Super Bowl ever. Boy, this feels good. Two sad notes, however, echoed after their impressive win. Walter Payton did not score a touchdown in the game. And soon after, defensive wizard Buddy Ryan would leave to take a head coaching job in Philadelphia. 
Nevertheless, Mike Ditka's Chicago Bears were indeed kings for a day. Hey, you wanted it, you worked for it, you earned it, and then you went on and took it. And God bless you. It's the greatest thing I've ever seen. I'm happy for every one of you. I love every one of you. here this guy bit my ear off uh but it grew back and then in 65 my finger fell off do you know in 71 i never wore any pads during the games didn't need them one time i stared at a team so hard they lost 15 yards before the snap find out what really happened by getting the bears a 75 year celebration available in three editions call 1-800-49-BEARS bear down chicago bears i wrote that you know